This is the Louis T Network. You are now officially in the lab room. It's that time again. It's that time again to go hard in the off season. Cause we trying to win. We gon' go so hard we don't take no days off. Hopefully one day it's all gonna be. For me, your me, Louis T. Welcome to the 2017 NFL Draft Wrap-Up Series where your man Louis T aims to break down all 32 teams in the National Football League's 2017 NFL Draft using our baseball greatest scale. Single, double, triple, home run. There are no strikeouts here in the Draft Wrap-Up Series. So you cannot tell how these players are going to pan out. And I don't want to discount any of these young men before they get their chance in the National Football League. And so... We will get a score for each and every single pick made by XZ team, divide by the number of picks, apply bonuses when necessary, which will then yield us a final overall score for that team's draft. We'll then move on to the next team in the series picked by you. That's right, you the viewers out there are in total control as this is the up format. You pick, you the viewer are in total control by simply being the first, not the second, not the third, not the 23rd, but the first person to comment in the comment section of the video with two things, the phrase next and the team you'd like to see next. An example would be Lions, next, next, Lions, Detroit Lions, next. Any of those combinations or any way you can come up with a way that's creative to get the phrase next and the team you'd like to see next. Don't get too cute though, I already warned you, this has been one of the fastest years thus far in terms of the comments coming in when the video is uploaded. So make sure you get it in and be very efficient in doing so. But that being said, next team up in the series, picked by you, the viewers, the Oakland Raiders. So we're gonna talk Raiders football in their 2017 NFL Draft. Reggie McKenzie, their GM, has done a pretty good job of building this team into a young, talented roster. That's why the Raiders were one of the most dangerous teams in the AFC Conference until the Derek Carr injury at the end of the season. So this is one of those teams with a couple more drafts, a couple more really good selections made by Reggie McKenzie could put this team over the top and potentially have them challenging the New England Patriots for the mantle of best team in the AFC. This is one of those drafts I look at and I question a lot of these picks, but the first two, not a lot of question marks for me there. Let's start with the first pick in the Raiders 2017 NFL Draft. Uh, 24th overall selection, Ohio State cornerback, Garyon Conley is the selection. And uh, this is, was a controversial pick when it was made. Uh, a lot of teams were very leery of making this selection. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. Let's talk about the pros and the positives that you get from a guy like Garyon Conley. Uh, size and length are the first pros that stick out to me. It's a guy with 33 inch arms at six feet. 195 pounds, that's the going rate for an NFL corner. We know this is a league now where the receivers are getting bigger and bigger every single year. And so you need a six foot or better corner. Let's face it. And I remember a time when a 5'10 corner was an average height for a corner, but now, and at that time, the average height was for a receiver was probably around six foot, six one. And if you were anything bigger than six one, you were huge. Now, a six two receiver is pretty much the standard size for a receiver. And if you're anything better than six one, six two, then you're, you're considered a big receiver. That, really, that's average. And six three and up is considered a big receiver. So uh, the, the times are changing, and so that's a position that has changed in terms of size and length. And, and having a thirty three inch arms to go with the six foot frame that's a really good size for an NFL corner athleticism uh, this is a guy that has athleticism and quicks a uh, 444 that Moses Malone 44440 uh, that's a great time at six feet with 33 inch arms uh, I, I love Gary on Connie he's one of my favorite corners in this draft and I'll talk about why uh, he jumped off the radar at me last year when I was watching a guy like Eli Apple uh, he, he stood out to me then, stood out to me this year, and we'll talk about that. And uh, the athleticism and the quicks, part of the reason why I fell in love with his game, watching him at Ohio State. Ball skills, okay? In order for me to really like you as a football player at the cornerback position, you gotta have ball skills. And the best way to have ball skills is to be an LLCer. So I'll go ahead and combine those two pros for Gary on Conley because in order to excel at the next level as a cornerback, 
You got to be able to look, locate, and contest the football. Gary on Conley does that. And the ball skills that I talked about is a, a little bit of proof as to him being able to look, locate, and contest. Six interceptions in the last two seasons. Had some big plays uh, in the playoff game last year uh, against Clemson. First possession of the game, Mike Williams slips and falls. He picks off the football. Uh, he's a guy that in different coverages, and that's the next pro, so let's go ahead and talk about that. Comfortable in multiple coverages and schemes. So if you're one of these teams that you want to play a lot of man-to-man -man coverage and you're going to leave your corners out on the island, Gary on Conley, perfectly fine with that. If you're a team that loves to play trap coverages and you, you want to make it look like it's cover three, but your corner is going to kind of trap a little bit, come back under, playing a little bit of cover two, he's comfortable and fine doing that as well. You want to play some cover three, have him with his eyes on the quarterback, keying quarterback's eyes, but staying deeper than the deepest in his third, he is comfortable doing that as well. Saw him make a beautiful interception uh, versus Wisconsin on an overthrown football. He's not even in that zone, but eyes on quarterback, sees where the football is going, comes back to the ball, picks it off, beautifully done. Again, he's comfortable in any coverage you want to put him in, any scheme you're playing. Gary on Conley, a guy that can get it done for you. He also, to me, is a proficient blitzer. They blitzed him quite a bit at Ohio State off the corner. You don't see this very much in the NFL because you gotta come from such a long ways. Unless you're blitzing from the slot, you don't see guys blitzing off the corner very much in the NFL, but some defensive coordinators still believe in that uh, uh, philosophy of blitzing from the cornerback position. He does it very well, times it up well, gets to the quarterback well. So I think he's a very proficient blitzer, a guy that if you feel like blitzing from the corner would be a designated uh, choice and option to do so. Also, he's a willing tackler. All right, I think he could be a little bit better in this realm. I think he could do this a little bit more aggressively, but he's willing to sacrifice and throw his body in the mix. He's willing to get his hands dirty. I can appreciate that. We'll talk about his tackling and, and some of the things I think he needs to uh, adjust and be a little bit better at as we get to his cons, but he's willing, and that's half the battle at the cornerback position, is being willing to throw your body in the mix and Gary on Conley is willing to do exactly that. And then this is my favorite thing. This is part of the reason why I became so attached with Gary on Conley um, at Ohio State. It is started for me last year, is this final pro. He's got the other, the other cornerback mentality. What I mean by the other cornerback mentality, it takes a special breed of corner to be the other guy, okay? Because you can do one of two things when you're the other guy. You can wilt under the pressure of being the other guy or you can excel. You can take that challenge on and become a better player because of it. Oh, you wanna target me because you're going away from Eli Apple? Oh, you wanna target me because you're going away from Marshawn Lattimore? Okay, I will show you better than I can tell you those six interceptions and his play consistently opposite of guys that teams did not want to throw against Eli Apple. Didn't get a ton of targets last year. They came after Garyon Conley. Marshawn Lattimore didn't get a ton of targets his way in 2015. They came after Garyon Conley and he stood up to that challenge week in and week out for the Ohio State Buckeyes. Part of the reason that defense was so good. Um, that offense let them down at the end of the season. They were one dimensional offensively and it caught up with them at the end of the year. Hence that Clemson blowout in the playoffs. However, this defense did some good things. Gary on Conley, a huge part of that. He has that mentality. Oh, you want to challenge me because you're scared of the other corner? I'm going to show you. And I love that about him. And I think that's something he's going to bring to the Oakland Raiders defense and really help them in their secondary. We move from his pros to his cons. Sometimes he can be slow in transition. Uh, he's one of these guys that he gets stuck in his back pedal a little bit sometimes, allows receivers to eat up his cushion. And that transition from back pedal to turn and sprint sometimes can be a little elongated. And if you get one of these receivers and a quarterback that are in sync, let's just say, let's just throw out a, a combination like a AJ Green and Andy Dalton. And, and they're hitting on all cylinders in this particular game. And AJ Green gives him a stick nod and gets to the top of his route and he's going on the go route. And Gary on Conley's kind of stuck in the mud on, a, on that turn and that transition from backpedal to sprint. 
This isn't college, okay? You're not playing against Illinois. You're not playing against Penn State where you're gonna be able to recover because the ball is slightly underthrown or this receiver isn't that great and isn't gonna go up and get the football. You make that mistake, you're gonna be uh, looking up at the scoreboard, giving up seven. And so uh, I think he needs to be a little bit more smooth in that transition. Uh, sometimes he can get a little stuck in neutral when making that transition from backpedal to uh, sprint or even planting and driving on the football uh, in, in certain instances. He'll get stuck on blocks. And I talked about him being a willing tackler, and that's great. I, I'm glad that he's willing to get nasty and physical and dirty in there, but uh, he, sometimes I think he allows guys to block him too easily. I think he needs to be more aggressive in getting off of those blocks and getting in the fray. I think he, he was one of those guys that gave up some runs, some extra yards, just because he simply didn't get off of blocks well enough. I think he can do that a little bit better at the next level. That will complete him as a cornerback, especially in run support. And then finally, we all know the big elephant in the room, the rape allegations that came out right before the draft. We're talking less than two weeks prior to the draft. Gary on Conley's name surfaces in potential rape allegations at a hotel. Um, in Ohio, uh, a lot of the details were sketchy. It just seemed like this was something that was kind of contrived by someone that really uh, wanted to get at him, maybe was even blackmailing him. I don't know all the details. I'm not here to speculate. I can't confirm nor deny whether he did it or he didn't do it. One thing's for sure, the Raiders did some homework prior to making this selection. Uh, he was given a polygraph test, he passed. So I knew a number of teams that were interested, including the Cowboys and the Ravens, uh, so th this was not a guy that I thought uh, was going to be selected in the first round, but after hearing he passed the polygraph test, I, I think there were other teams that were very interested that would have pulled the trigger in the first round had he been on the board uh, past this pick for the Raiders. So uh, the Raiders did their due diligence. I think they feel comfortable with the rape allegations and, and they feel like he's good. those things are going to be dismissed. They're going to be dropped. They're going to be found to be not true. And he's going to be allowed to play football and uh, continue on as an Oakland Raider. So uh, we'll see how that whole situation plays itself out right now. Um, everyone's assuming innocence until proven guilty. That's the way it should be. And I think the Raiders feel confident that he's going to be um, uh, uh, absolved of all wrongdoing in this matter and they're going to move on. So uh, with that being said, uh, this guy is one of my favorite corners in this draft. And with that being said, you know how I feel about this pick. It's hit up. It's hit deep. I hit the home run for the Oakland Raiders as they take the Ohio State University cornerback, Gary on Conley with the first selection, 24th pick overall in the first round. Love this selection for the Raiders, a team that needs help in a secondary that is aging very rapidly. You move on to the second round pick for this Raiders football team, 56th overall, UConn safety, Obi Mellon Fonwu, which is one of the most gifted and athletically gifted players in this draft is the selection. Let's talk about this guy uh, who lit it up at the combine. We knew he would light it up and uh, really jumped on a lot of teams' radars. I thought he might have ended up in the first round like his uh, ex-UConn teammate Byron Jones did some two years ago when he lit it up at the combine, but that wasn't the case for Obi. and it was a gift that fell into the lap of the Ra Raiders. Let's talk about him. Uh, first pro, genetic freak. Height, weight, speed, specimen, if I've ever seen one. Generally, you don't get to get into every line. You know, when God is handing out attributes and things of that nature, smarts, size, uh, length, um, speed, all of these things, generally, you don't get to get into every line. Well, this guy got into every single line. 6'4", 224 pounds, 4'4", four, four, flat, 40 you're talking about a guy with an 11.7 broad. You're talking about a guy with a 44 inch vertical leap. Are you kidding me? All right, so this guy is dripping, oozing from every nook and cranny with just pure athleticism. And he's got the size and the frame to match. And there are people out there that are saying he could put on another five to 10 pounds if he wanted to and still be that athletic, which to me is insane. But yet that's what this guy has the ability to potentially do. Downhill thumper. With all of those measurables, you get a guy that is physically inclined to hit you. Okay, he will come downhill 15, 20 yards off the pace and he will smash you 
He is not afraid to put his helmet in your chest and drive you backwards, which is what you're supposed to do with that kind of imposing size at the safety position. He's not afraid to unload on a ball carrier. Outstanding range. Uh, I, I just talked about the 4-4 speed and his ability uh, to come downhill. It's evident that this guy has just limitless range, okay? If, if he makes up his mind that he's getting from point A to point B and there is no hindrance, no blockage from him getting from point A to point B, he's gonna get there in a hurry. And there's nothing that's going to stop him in terms of athleticism. There's no limitations there. He can make up a lot of ground in a little bit of time. And uh, th that range is just tremendous on the football field. And you can see it when you watch tape of OB Mellon Fonwu. Ball skills, all right? Eight career interceptions. Six of those INTs have come over the last two years, and we're talking about a four-year starter here, folks. So he turned it on and got better as a football player. And this is a guy that needed the reps. He needed to be on the field playing. And so four years of experience at UConn really helped him greatly become a much better football player. And you can start to see it in the last two years, him starting to flourish in uh, the ball skill department. I think there's still a lot for him to improve upon. There's still a lot more that he can be better at, but his ball skills have come a long way. And those eight interceptions, six in the last two years, are a little bit of uh, proof in that. Versatility, uh, the thing that I love about him probably the most, uh, outside of his measurables and his just genetic freakish ability, size, weight, speed, uh, all of that stuff, is his ability to just line up in different spots on the football field. At UConn, they lined him up at corner, they lined him up in the slot, and then they lined him up at safety. They lined him up at single high safety, they lined him up close to the box, they lined him up 30 yards away from the, this line of scrimmage. I mean, you name it, he did it. Uh, at cover two safety, he did some of everything. And so that versatility is gonna lend itself well to this Oakland Raiders defense that could use a guy that can move around and do some things for them defensively. Uh, experience is the final pro. And I talked about this. Those four years were critical for his uh, growth as a football player at UConn. And uh, he needed each and every single one of those seasons. And I think he's a much better football player because he played four years at UConn and started. And now I think that's going to help him in his development and transition from college football stud to NFL player. You go from his pros, however, to his cons. And I've got a couple of things that I think he needs to clean up at the next level in order to maximize the God-given talent and ability he's been blessed with. First, he's slow to diagnose, okay? He's one of those guys that he needs to see it happening before he will react to what's going on. You don't make plays like that at the next level. By the time, these guys are so good that if you wait to see it, it's already happening. You have to be more proactive than reactive at the next level. You've got to watch the tape. You've got to be able to guess and be able to make certain assumptions of things that are going to happen. Draw inferences and make plays. When you sit back and you watch things unfold in front of you, it's too late. Now you're just looking to make a tackle. You want to be a little bit more proactive in what you're doing. And so to me, he's really reactionary right now. He's slow to react. He's got to see it happen before he actually goes in and tries to make a play. And, and a lot of times in college, you may be able to get away with that at the next level, not so much. Also, I think he needs to take better angles as a single high safety. There are too many times where I see a guy with all this speed, all this ability to make up ground, he has the ability to take the right angle and be on top of the football making a play, and instead, he's coming from underneath trying to make a play. You, as, a, as a single high safety, there's no reason for you to allow a play to get behind you, especially with that kind of speed, that kind of size, you should be in, in, in a position to make plays on the football quite often, and from the top, of the play, not underneath, not behind the receiver, not behind the defender, but on top. And uh, too many times I feel like he's taking poor angles to the football, which is allowing receivers to get behind him and forcing him to have to make acrobatic plays to get to the football. Shouldn't be the case. He should be in great position with that speed, that size. If he takes proper angles, he will be in a position to make plays on the football a lot more often. And then finally, uh, there are a couple of things that I think he needs to do better. One, stop being blocked so easily. For a guy his size, I feel like he allows himself to get blocked way too easy in the run game. I think he needs to be a little bit more physical when taking on these blocks, be able to dodge some of these uh, 
blockers and get to the ball carrier a little bit more effectively. And finally, he's too big, he's too long, he's too athletic to not high point the football. Too many times I see this guy jumping in the air to catch it with his chest. I don't know if he's comfortable catching it with his hands or not. I did see him pick off a couple of passes with his hands. I'd love to see him go up and high point the football. There's no reason you're 6'4", 224 with a wingspan out of this world and you're looking to jump only to catch the football, cradling, cradling it up here by your chest. You should be going up highest point and snap. Nobody else can go up and get it. Only a few receivers in this league can go up 44 inches in burst that are 6'4". There are only a handful of guys. A.J. Green, uh, Julio Jones, there are only a few. Des Bryant that can climb the ladder, go up, and compete with a guy that's 6'4", with a 44-inch burst. He should be going up. He should be the first one touching the football in a jump ball situation. And a lot of times, he's not. And so I'd love to see him uh, go and explode up to the ball and then extend and go and get the football, but uh, this is a heck of a football player. I think the best football for Obi Melon Fanwu is in front of him in the second round, 56th overall selection. Uh, UConn safety Obi Melon Fanwu for me is a triple. I think the Raiders uh, doubled down in the secondary. Uh, you got an older uh, safety in Reggie Nelson, and you you saw some of the turnover at the cornerback position. DJ Hayden moved on. And I think Sean Smith is getting older up there in age. He was a little disappointing in his first season as a Raider. I think they realized that they need to revamp the safety position. Uh, I was never a Nate Allen fan. He got injured last year. You need some new blood at the safety position, at the cornerback position. And they went and attacked that uh, with their first two picks. And I think there were two really good first uh, picks in this draft. You go to the third round. This is where the draft kind of takes a sharp turn for me where I, I start to question. And this is where, if you're a Raiders fan, you just believe in Reggie McKenzie. This is where you say, in Reggie, we trust. Starting with this next pick. Third round, 88th overall selection, UCLA defensive tackle, Eddie Vanderdose is the selection. 6'3", 305 pounds is the first pro. His size, he's a big man. And he had to get down to 305. We'll talk about that a little bit later on when we get to some of the cons. But uh, 305, 6'3", that's a good weight for him. He needs to stay around that 300 pound threshold. Does not need to get up into the 315, 320 range. That's when he starts to get himself into trouble. Uh, athleticism, for a guy his size, He's a sneaky athlete. If you watch him on tape, you're like, wow, this guy's moving, okay? 49940, okay? This guy can move. Don't allow yourself to look at his body type. And if you just look at Eddie Vanderdose with the eyeball test, you say, this guy's a fat slob. But if you watch him on tape, you're like, whoa, this guy's moving. He's an athlete. Don't allow his uh, look, just first blush, to fool you. This guy's an athlete. Heavy hands. I, I, I watched him ragdoll a couple of offensive linemen. Just, just take them and shake them and discard them. Uh, he's got heavy hands and the ability to really make some things happen at the point of attack, which takes me to my next uh, pro. Solid at the point of attack. This guy, heavy hands, the ability to really shock and awe offensive linemen, ragdoll them, toss them out of the way, redirect. Uh, th th there's a number of things that he brings to the table. When he's on, he's a disruptive force up front. He can collapse the pocket. Those heavy hands are good for shocking that offensive lineman and then getting them off balance and allowing him to get up under their pads and drive them backwards. He can collapse the pocket in passing situations. He's got some versatility to him. You can play him at nose. In the Raiders uh, defense, they're gonna play him as a three tech. So he gives you a little bit of versatility whether you wanted to run a three four. Or, because a lot of these teams run multiple defenses now where you're playing some three four, you're playing some four three, you're playing nickel. And so either way, uh, he's given, gonna give you some versatility. You can use him in a number of different ways if you're the Raiders. And then finally, I think the biggest pro, the reason he gets drafted here in the third round is his senior bowl practices. I think a lot of uh, teams were at the senior bowl practices and they were really amazed and wowed by Eddie Vanderdose's ability to drop some weight, look in shape, and then really beat the hell out of some offensive linemen at the senior bowl practices. I thought he really looked good. I thought he stood out at the senior bowl practices. He looked like a guy that was a five-star recruit coming out of high school in California. He looked like a guy that a lot of teams in college football were salivating over and fighting over to get him to come to their school. He looked like the guy that was going to have a huge impact in college football uh, when he was coming out of high school at the senior bowl practices. That upside that little glimpse into what this guy could be when he's in shape, 
I think is what got him drafted in the third round, really made Reggie McKenzie fall in love with him and pull the trigger on him in the third round. You go from there to his cons, his weight. Let's start right there. His weight. Um, and it's, it's like a, a really, uh, process. It's a really bad process for him, how he got to where his weight became an issue. It wasn't an issue when he first got to UCLA. He came onto the scene. He was a good football player and he was doing some good things for them at UCLA. And then he tears his ACL in 2015, which is the next con. Uh, that's a big injury for him. Uh, it really stunted his growth as a football player. And more importantly, it made him heavy. He came back in 2016, he was not the same guy, which is another con, okay? 2016 season in itself was not good for Eddie Vanderdose. I watched at least four games in 2016, not impressed. He looked slow, he looked sluggish, he looked out of sorts. Uh, there were flashes, but they were few and far between. And so if that's the guy you're getting, then you wasted the third round pick. And that's why the senior bowl practices were so big for him, because I think they think that they're going to get the guy that they saw at the senior bowl, the guy that was in shape, the guy that was motivated, the guy that looked more like the five star recruit coming out of high school and not the guy that you saw coming off the ACL in 2015 uh, in 2016 season that was heavy, that was lethargic, that looked out of sorts. And so uh, to me. He, his weight, the, the ACL tear of 2015 and the 2016 season, all cons, and I think they're all related to one another. So I'm not gonna beat him up too much for that. What I will say is that he doesn't have a big enough impact on the game. Even before the injury, I thought his impact was minimal at best. Uh, there were times where he would flash, but it wasn't consistent enough for me uh, from a guy that was a five-star recruit coming out of high school. Uh, so I'd, I'd love to see him be a little bit more impactful on a consistent basis. And then finally, to me, he gets off the snap really slow. I think there are too many times where I watch him and everyone else is off the ball. And of the four defensive linemen, he's the last one coming off the, the snap. He's not fast enough. He's not quick enough uh, to come off the ball so slow and still have an impact. And so that's something he's going to have to watch the football. He's going to have to go off a of first movement. He's going to have to do something to rectify that because right now, to me, it's a big issue. But in the third round, 88th overall selection, UCLA defensive tackle Eddie Vanderdose for me is a double. Uh, this is strictly an upside pick. Reggie McKenzie is banking on getting the guy that he saw at the Senior Bowl and not the guy that we saw in 2016. I can't be assured of that, that the Senior Bowl is such a small glimpse into the window of who a football player really is. Uh, you wanna see guys compete, you wanna see them go out and kind of confirm what you saw on tape. That's not what Vanderdose did at the Senior Bowl. He exceeded expectations at the Senior Bowl. He showed them what he could be once upon a time. Now they need to see that from him on a consistent basis. I don't know if that's gonna happen or not. We'll see if this third round pick is going to be justified or not. You go to the fourth round, 129th overall selection, Florida offensive lineman David Sharp is the selection. We start with his size and length, standing 6'6", 343 pounds. This is a big, massive, mammoth man with 35 inch arms. Tells you all you need to know in terms of size and length and why those are pros for him at the next level. He's got sneaky movement skills. When you watch him, you say, okay, this guy's 6'6", he's 343, he can't be that good of an athlete, but when you see him get out on the edge, I'm like, wait, this guy's moving, okay? A couple of those tunnel screens, a little bit of those, those bubble screens, a couple of running back screens, you watch him against Tennessee, they get him out on the edge, and he is just getting out there and molly whopping guys, and so he can move. Sneaky movement skills for a guy that's damn near 350 pounds. He anchors well. Look, if you're 6'6", 343, your ass better anchor well. You better be able to dig your heels into the turf and say, hey, you're not moving me, okay? You're not going to move me and jack me up, put me on skates, and get me into the lap of the quarterback. You better be able to anchor down and say, hey, man, <laughs> the party stops right here. And he can do that very well at 6'6", 343 pounds. Or ability to recover. When you got 35 inch arms, you don't have to be perfect in your technique. You can miss, you can lunge and still recover. You can get beat to the inside and use those go-go gadget arms to extend and push a guy around the quarterback and allow the quarterback to step up and throw the football. Uh, he has the ability to do that with those 35 inch arms. Flexibility, not necessarily from the collegiate level. He didn't play multiple positions while at Florida, but I think that at the next level, you're gonna have to use this guy as a guard, I, I, I think. I don't think this is a guy that's gonna be able to survive outside at tackle, unless it's in a pinch and you need a guy to step in for you. 
at the tackle position. He may be able to do that for you, but I think he's going to be more suited as a guard at the next level. We'll find out. The Raiders have a huge hole at right tackle right now. I think that's a position that they feel like they need to address. And I think they may feel like David Sharp could be that guy for them. And that may be the case. I just don't think necessarily that that is the case, but we'll find out. We'll see what they have in store for him. Uh, when you spend a fourth round pick on a guy, I think the initial uh, idea is that we'll, we'll try him at tackle first, and if that doesn't work, we'll kick him inside the guard. And so I think that's where that flexibility may come in to play. And then finally, he played in the SEC, and like I tell you all the time, that's a pro. All right, you're going up. I watched this guy up against some elite pass rushers, NFL caliber pass rushers. I saw him against Charles Harris. I watched him against Derek Barnett. I watched him against Jonathan Allen. I watched him against the nation's best on a week in, week out basis. That's what you get when you play in the SEC. You're playing against NFL caliber players every single week. And so that is definitely a pro. You go from that to his cons. And this is a guy that is the traditional, prototypical, Mike Mayock termed heavy legged waist bender, if I've ever seen one. This is a guy that will lunge at you, that will not move his feet, but will instead lunge and look to reach to get his hands on a defensive lineman. And those, those, those savvy elite pass rushers, they know what's coming and they're quick to slap down hands and beat him around the edge. I saw him get absolutely molested and abused, okay? by Derek Barnett. Barnett put on a clinic versus David Sharp. It was brutal, okay? I watched Charles Harris, which takes me to my next con. Got his ass whooped by elite rushers, okay? I watched Derek Barnett put on a clinic versus David Sharp. Remember, Tennessee was down big in that game. They came roaring back. Part of the reason why Derek Barnett was whooping David Sharp's ass. All right, then I watched uh, him. I thought he was okay versus Charles Harris, but Harris put a mean spin move on him, ducked around the corner on him another time, beat him to the quarterback. So he had his problems with Charles Harris as well. And then I watched him against Alabama. I thought he was actually okay versus Alabama, but he looked slow against Alabama in that football game. But nonetheless, uh, I just feel like he's not a guy that's going to be able to uh, uh, survive on the outside, which is my final uh, con with him. He's not quick enough to survive on the outside, I don't think, at the next level. And you know what I look at him as? I look at him as a guy that you drafted last year out of LSU, out of the SEC. Same size, same type of football player. He looks like a clone of Vidal Alexander. I'm like, didn't you go to that well last year? How were those results for you? Okay, he looks, he feels... He smells like Vidal Alexander from last year. who Another guy who I told you last year, I didn't think was fit to be a tackle at the next level. And I think you kind of found that out a little bit last year that he's not a great tackle option, only in a pinch. So I have my reservations on David Sharp. He's a guy that I think can get better. And if anyone you're gonna trust to make this type of selection is an ex uh, hog and Office of Lyman and Reggie McKenzie. So we'll see what he does with a young player like David Sharp, who was really good for the Florida Gators. Don't let me deter you in thinking that this guy can't play because he can. I just think that he struggles in some situations. He's going to see some elite athletes. You know, in, in the AFC West, you don't want to be a heavy legged weight spinner. You don't want to put a guy out on the edge. You can't hide suspect tackles in the AFC West. Of all the divisions in football, the one division you can't hide suspect tackle play, AFC West. The Kansas City Chiefs can throw them to you, throw them at you in waves. So can the Denver Broncos and the Chargers are on the come up with Joey Bozer and company coming after the quarterback. You can't hide suspect tackles in the AFC West. I don't think you should put David Sharp on the edge. In the fourth round, 129th overall selection, Florida offensive lineman David Sharp for me is a double. I think this guy is going to make a living at the next level as a guard and a guy that in a pinch can play tackle for you, but I would not recommend it. You move on to the next selection, fifth round, 168th overall selection, Wake Forest linebacker, Markwell Lee is the selection. I was breaking down the draft um, in my live draft party with a ton of Raiders fans who were clamoring for a linebacker in the first round, clamoring for a linebacker in the second round, clamoring for a linebacker in the third round. They finally get one in the fifth round. 
And uh, this is a solid linebacker, but they were looking for a This, to me, was the biggest need going in to the draft, and they waited to the fifth round to address it. I don't know if the board kind of fell in a way that uh, saw the Raiders shy away from the linebacker position uh, or not, but uh, to get a guy in the fifth round like Mark Welly, it's fine, but he's not a true difference maker. Let's, let's break him down. Uh, you start with his, his pros and his size. 6'3", 240 pounds. To me, that's a throwback linebacker. You don't see those guys come along anymore and excel at the next level. Uh, it's now the mold of a Ryan Shazier. That's the, the new breed of linebacker. Reuben Foster, the six uh, foot, 6'1", 229, 232 pound linebacker. That's the new NFL. The guy that's fast, that's slim, that can run and hit and still be physical. That's the new NFL. The days of the 6'3", 240 pound, you know, tough guy, neck roll linebacker, they're dead. And so, um, we're gonna talk about some of his limitations, but his size is great. If you're looking for a thumper to come downhill, hit somebody, and stop the power from moving, Markwell Lee is your guy. Strength, I talked about him being a physical football player, 25 reps of two and a quarter, tells you all you need to know, he's a muscle head. And we're not talking about one of these short-armed, you know, 6'1 Samoan muscle heads that's pumping up iron 38 times. This guy's 6'3", he's got long arms, 25 reps of two and a quarter. It's a strong man, okay? Uh, impact tackler. Uh, this is a guy that when he hits a running back, he's not getting drug along for an extra two yards uh, on a ride. Uh, he hits a guy and he stops at impact and he's driving them backwards. That's what Markwell Lee does. He's a hat on a hat, physical, a, a lunch pail, hard hat type of guy. He's an impact tackler. Instincts. If you're not going to be the greatest athlete, you better come with some instincts. He has some instincts. There's still limitations there on his instincts, but they're there. He will come. You don't make 100 tackles two out of the last three seasons by accident. You got to have instincts to do that. So this guy has instincts. He plays on the other side of the line of scrimmage. That's the next pro. Uh, 20 tackles for loss last year. He damn near doubled his entire collegiate output, 42 for his career. And you're talking about a guy that, a uh, four-year starter at Wake, 42 tackles for loss, 20 last season, guys putting in work. So he does play on the other side of the line of scrimmage. Um, capable blitz are seven and a half sacks, 14 and a half for his career. So a guy that doubled his career output last year, uh, or half it, I should say, uh, did a really good job of getting to the quarterback from the inside linebacker position. So that means he's a capable blitzer. Uh, I'd like to see him have a little bit more wiggle, but that's just not a part of his game. Uh, but he does get home. If you create a crevice for him, he will get home and he will get to the quarterback. Uh, brains of the defense. This is a guy that you, you watch him on tape and he's barking out the signals. He's the green dot guy at the next level. He's lining everybody up. He's going down and he's tapping that defensive lineman. He's screaming orders to that safety to scoot over a little bit. He's telling the corner, hey, we're switching to cover three. He's that guy. He's the brains of the defense. He's the brains of the operation. I love that about Markwell Lee. Heavy collegiate production is the last pro. Uh, he's just as consistent as the day is long. That's what you want from an inside linebacker. Year after year after year after year, this guy compiled Tackles after tackles after tackles, made plays. He was the heart and soul of this Wake Forest defense. You knew what you were getting week in, week out from Markwell Lee. So you go from those pros to his cons. Doesn't have great play speed. Despite running a 4-6 at his pro day, uh, this guy doesn't play at a 4-6 speed. I watched him against Florida State, and Dalvin Cook and company were running circles around him. They were running circles around Markwell Lee. It made him look as if he was stuck in mud. There were times where they would get to the outside, he'd have the angle, and Dalvin Cook would just beep beep and just straight road runner Wild E. Coyote. And that's what Markwell Lee looked like. He looked like Wild E. Coyote trying to keep up with the road runner, and he didn't stand a chance. And so that scared me. It scared me to the point where I said, his play speed can't be 4-6. He can't be a 4-6 linebacker because Dalvin Cook is barely a 4-5, four, four, uh, a sub-4-5 guy. And he was making, um, Markwell Lee was making Dalvin Cook look like a sub-4-3 guy. He made him look that fast. So um, he doesn't play at a 4-6 speed level. Uh, this is, he looks more like a 4-7 guy, to be honest with you. Um, limited redirect. 
He's one of those guys that once you get him flowing in one direction, all right, once that quarterback stretches and gets to that landmark and hands that football off and that running back presses that hole and then he sticks his foot in the ground and Marquel Lee gets going one way, he can't stop, redirect, and follow that. He can't mirror that, that running back to that cutback lane. Once he gets that 6'3", 240-pound frame going in one direction, it's hard for him to stop it and redirect it in another direction. Uh, he struggles with redirect. And also, to me, he strikes me as a two-down thumper. Um, despite having some solid drop, zone drop coverage skills, I think if you put this guy on the field um, in passing situations, he's going to be a liability. I look at him as a two-down thumper, a guy that you want on the field, first, second down, stopping the run. But I think in situations where you're looking to stop the pass, I don't necessarily know if he blitzes well enough and is good enough in coverage to be on the field on third downs. Um, I thought the Raiders needed more of an impact linebacker than this. And I think he's a solid football player. Worst case scenario, you're getting a hell of a special teams player here. But they needed help. This was the position that they probably needed the most help at. And to just grab one guy in the fifth round, I don't think it's enough. 168th pick, uh, Wake Forest linebacker Mark Lee for me is another double for the Oakland Raiders in this draft. You go to the seventh round, Raiders had four seventh round selections. This is a guy that I actually really like here in the seventh round. I think he has a legitimate shot at making this Raiders roster. Uh, seventh round, 221st pick overall, Washington State safety, Shalom. Uh, Luani is the pick. Uh, this is a guy that I, I first watched him against Boise State and I actually watched this game on television and number 18 just kept jumping off the screen at me. I, I didn't go as far as to figure out who he was. I just said, damn, 18 was pretty impressive tonight and it turned out to be Shalom Luani and uh, th this is a guy that I said, man, I think this guy is just someone that's around the football a ton and is a guy that's gonna make some NFL roster even if it's not this Raiders football team. Let's talk about him. 5'11", 202 pounds. He's a good athlete, all right? His size isn't gonna jump off the screen. Normally, size is the first pro. It's not the case here, but he's a really good athlete. 4'5", 5'40". He can run. When you watch him on the field, he can run. He's a good athlete. He can run sideline to sideline. Uh, I love that about him. Physicality is probably the best trait that he brings to the table along with his coverage skills, which I think are top notch for a guy his size. Uh, he's gonna come down and hit you. Now, it's to a detriment. It's a gift and a curse, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on, but make no mistake about it. Shalom Luani is looking to dislodge man from ball. Period, end of discussion. He's looking to tear somebody's head off every single time he hits somebody. He's always around the football, that's the next pro. I told you, he's always around the action. Uh, it, whether it's in, in, in the pass game, run game, he's just around. And those guys tend to have good fortunes for them. All right, the guys that are always around the ball, always around the action, tend to have good things happen for them. He's one of those players that just jumps out the screen at me as a guy that's just always around the action. He's got ball skills. And when you're always around the action, these are the types of things that lend themselves to happening to you. Having the opportunity to pick the football up. He was only at Washington State for two years. Eight INTs in those two seasons, four in each of those seasons. So he's around the ball and he's making plays on the football. Love that. And he's got legit hands. He'll go up, he'll snatch the football out of the air. That Boise State game I was talking about, two interceptions in that game. He was huge in that game, even though they fell short in that game. He gave them a shot to try to steal one on the road versus a tough Boise State football team. Great in coverage. To me, uh, his physicality and his coverage skills are what are going to keep him around in this league along with probably being a standout special teams guy because he's going to hit somebody. And so uh, I think he's going to be great in coverage. He's a guy that I think going to make a team just because he's a smart, heady football player in coverage. He keys quarterbacks eyes well. That's the next pro. And because of that, I think there's flexibility with this guy to put him in the slot, which they did quite a bit, which is the final pro. Flexibility. He played in the slot at, at, at Washington State. He played at safety. Uh, they had some liabilities with him at safety, so they wouldn't put him in certain situations because of some of the problems that they had with him. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on, but make no mistake about it. They were comfortable with him over the slot against a receiver or a tight end. And in and, and that Boise State game, I watched him against Oregon State as well, where he had another two picks. Uh, he's more than comfortable 
covering your slot. Whether that's a receiver or a tight end, he doesn't care. He's more than comfortable covering the slot and gives you that flexibility that you need in this day and age in the NFL, especially when you're going up against these athletic tight ends that can run. You need a guy now 5'11 in the greatest size with these 6'3", 6'4", 6'5", tight ends. But man, he'll stay in their hip pocket and if the quarterback doesn't put the football high enough, he will make the quarterback pay. You go to his cons, reckless tackler. That's what's going to stop him from being an everyday starting safety in the National Football League. He doesn't wrap up. He's looking for the kill shot each and every single time. In two seasons at Washington State, he was charged with 31 missed tackles and 11 broken tackles. That's 42 missed tackles altogether while at Washington State in just two years. That's insane, okay? So because they couldn't trust him as the last line of defense, it limits what you can do with him at the safety position. It limits the coverages that you can play. And so that puts your defense in sort of a disadvantage and uh, in sort of a, a kind of a precarious situation because now you're limiting what you can do because he's one of those guys that's looking to come for the kill shot. And we know at the next level, you try to blow up one of these big, tough, Anquan Bolden type receivers, they're gonna bounce off of that shoulder that you delivered at, at, at Washington State that knocked the guy backwards two yards. He's gonna bounce off of that and run for a 47 yard touchdown and you just can't have that at the next level. So uh, he has to be better at tackling. And finally, his instincts in the run game, to me, uh, lag, severely lag behind his instincts in the pass game. As a pass defender, he is top notch. He's exceptional to me. I, I love him over the slot. I love him in coverage keying eyes on the quarterback and making plays on the football. I love him. I love him as a cover two safety. Problem is, when he's 15 yards off the ball, it takes him a long time to respond and get to the line of scrimmage and get in the fret. It takes him a long time to react to run. By that time, the running back seven yards into the second level, and now he's coming up and trying to clean it up. And so I think his, his react and instincts to the run game is severely lagging behind his ability to make plays in the past game. And so um, in the seventh round, 221st uh, pick overall, the one, uh, Shalom Luani for me is a double. Man, I think this guy's gonna make this Raiders roster. I think if he doesn't make this Raiders roster, he's gonna make somebody's NFL roster because he's a core special teamer and he's the type of guy that I think you could put in in the slot and in some nickel and sub packages and have this guy come in and be an impact player for you. Uh, he's not gonna be a standout, but I think he's one of those glue guys that you need on your football team to help you get by. And I, I think he's good enough to be your third or your fourth safety on your roster. Uh, I like uh, Shalom Luani and I think he's a playmaker. And so uh, I'd love to see him have an opportunity in Oakland. And I don't think they're that deep at the safety position in Oakland. I'd love to see him get an opportunity in camp. And go to the next seventh round pick, um, 231st overall. Um, this is a guy that played at a small school, Alabama State. Offensive lineman Jalen Ware is the selection. Uh, this is a big man, 6'8", 295 pounds. So size and length right there off the bat, first pro, 34 inch arms. At 6'8", this guy is massive. Uh, got some athleticism. He's a lean body guy at 295. We'll talk about that a little bit later on, but he can move. And then when you watch him on tape, he's just absolutely mauling guys in the run game, in the screen game, he's just, He's getting out in front and these guys want no part of him. And again, he's playing at, at, at Alabama State in the swag. You know, these guys don't want any part of this freight train coming their way, 6'8", you know, damn near 300 pounds. They don't want any part of it. I'm watching him de devour, you know, 6'1", 215 pound defensive ends. It was a joke. So um, he's got some athleticism. He's got patience and the ability to mirror very well. Uh, he's not one of these guys, we talked about David Sharp and him being a heavy-legged weight spender, him overextending and being anxious to try to get his hands on a defender. Jalen Ware is the polar opposite. He's in his stance, he's ready to go, but he's not gonna jump at it. He's not gonna jump at a defender. He's gonna wait until that defender gets into that threatening zone, and then he's gonna put his hands on him. And so he does a really good job being patient, staying the course, and then when he needs to engage and deliver a, a solid blow, he does it with those 34 inch arms. He's got the ability to recover and, and that's what length does for you. That's why when you, you talk about tackles 
and, and, and scouts looking at these guys. That's why it's gotta be 33 inch arms or better because they're looking for the ability to recover. They're looking for you to be able to get your hands on the defender before they get their hands on you. And if you, if you miss, or if you're slow off the ball, you gotta have the ability to recover and push a guy around the quarterback and allow him to step up. And uh, he has the ability to do that with those 34 inch arms. And uh, finally, he dominated the competition. And you know my one, one requirement of any small school guy dominate the competition. I don't really give a damn. Who they put you in front of? Dominate the competition. He did that at the FCS level, at, in the SWAC at Alabama State. So. Um, all he could do is do what he was supposed to do, and he did that by dominating. Uh, Cons. He needs to add some more pounds to his frame. That's a given. You can't be 6'8 and 295. Those two terms don't go together. Uh, that's like a guy in the NBA being 6'10 but 210 pounds. That can't happen. That's disproportionate. Disproportionate, okay? He needs to be 315 pounds. If you're a six, if you're a six eight guy, you should be like 315, 320. All right. So he's got to put on some more, and they're gonna do that. They're gonna put some more pounds on his frame. That's not something that I really worry about. To me, he's laid off the snap too often. Um, you can get away with that in the swack. All right. <laughs> you can't get away with that in the NFL. Not in the, not in the AFC West. Not with Von Miller, not with Justin Houston, not with Joey Boza. You can't get away with that. If you're gonna, if you're gonna be a guy that's gonna play at this next level, you're gonna have to get off the snap on time. All right, um, he's got to be better. He got away with it at, at uh, Alabama State because he's six eight. He's he got thirty four inch arms, and it's the swag. He didn't see one NFL caliber player his entire career at Alabama State. He opens up too soon. And there were a couple of times I saw him beat to the inside, watching him on tape. Uh, but he did a great job of recovering, you know, and, and you can get away with that. But, you know, if, if you open up your hips to the outside and then the guy goes inside, if this guy's got elite quickness, you know, Shaquille Barrett does that for the Denver Broncos. All right. You're not going to get back to the inside and be able to push him around. You're beat. <laughs> okay. All right. So that's something he's going to have to clean up. You can get away with those types of things in college. You can't get away with these. Got to be able to stay balanced and not open up his hips too soon and not feel threatened to speed to the outside, open up too soon and give it up to the inside. Um, and also his final con um, level of competition. I'm not going to kill him for that. We know what it is. Um, we're going to see how he competes at the next level. I'm not going to beat him up for level of competition. He dominated the competition. Let's see how he does at the next level. Um, in the seventh round, uh, 231st pick overall, uh, Alabama State defense uh, offensive lineman Jalen Ware for me is a double for the Oakland Raiders. Another one of these Reggie McKenzie projects at the offensive line positions. Uh, let's see what this guy turns into if he, in fact, even makes this Raiders roster. To me, he's a developmental guy. You draft him, you stash him, you work with him over the next year or two and see what you have down the line. Uh, the next seventh round selection, 242nd overall, North Carolina running back Elijah Hood is the selection. This was the guy that everyone thought was going back to college. He surprisingly uh, declared right at the last second for the NFL draft, and uh, he ends up being a seventh round pick. Let's talk about him quickly. Uh, 5'11", 232 pounds. This guy's big uh, for a running back. That size is the first pro uh, because he is an in-between the tackles runner, which is another pro. So to be 5'11", 232 uh, that's good size for what the Raiders are going to ask him to do if he is, in fact, a guy that makes this roster. Right now, with Marshawn Lynch on the roster, I don't think he is a guy that's going to make this team unless the Raiders decide to carry four backs. Right now, I just see three in the Raiders' future. Lynch, uh, DeAndre Washington, and Jalen Richard. I don't see this guy cracking that roster. Uh, but if they have a spot for him, uh, I think Elijah Hood could be a guy that could make this uh, Raiders roster. Um, if not, they'd love to probably stash him. And when Marshawn Lynch, who probably has two, maybe three at best years left in him uh, football, uh, then you bring up a guy like Hood and you see if he can deliver for you. Um, we'll see what happens. But his size and strength, um, this is a guy that uh, you watch him in the first game of the season versus Georgia. And there's a run off the, the left tackle where he runs through about four um, arm tackles. And it's just a physical, imposing run from a guy that is a physically imposing running back 
And so, um, to me, though, that's that's who he is as a running back. Not gonna beat you with speed. Not gonna beat you with any wiggle or, or burst or anything. He's just looking to run through arm tackles. Uh, he's a yaster, and that play to me exemplifies who he is as a running back. Uh, he's gonna run through arm tackles. If you don't come with your hard hat and a lunch pail, you're not gonna get him down on the ground. Uh, he's not gonna make you miss, but you're not gonna come with a feeble, half-assed attempt at getting him on the ground either. Uh, you're gonna have to come and come with a form tackle if you wanna get Elijah Hood on the ground. He's got some pass catching ability. I don't think he's a dynamic pass uh, receiver and, and catcher out of the backfield, but he can catch a football. He can go down low and scoop a couple. I saw him go down low and scoop a couple uh, off the turf and, and make some catches to put them in some manageable third down situations. So uh, he can catch a football out of the backfield. Um, and I think the biggest pro, much like Eddie Vanderdose, when you watch him at the uh, at the um, uh, Senior Bowl 2015, is Elijah Hood's stay, you know, fame to uh, claim to fame. It's what he's staking his future on. That productivity in 2015, that's what everybody looks at and says, that's the best of Elijah Hood. If you can get that Elijah Hood, the the 1400 yard plus. 17 touchdown back that dominated the ACC. If you can get that guy, that's that's the guy that can help you at the next level. You know, if you get the guy that's off injured, that um, split carries with TJ Logan, that was less than stellar, that lacked speed, not going to make you miss. If you get that guy, he's probably not going to make your roster in the NFL at the next level. Um, speaking of which, let's go to his cons. Um, he's a monotone runner. He's a four, five, eight guy. You were hoping he'd be closer to four five. He wasn't. He's a four five eight guy, and, and, and you see that on tape. So it didn't surprise me that he's a four five eight guy. He doesn't have gears. Okay, he doesn't shift to four five eight. He's just a four five eight guy. From the time he gets the football to the time he gets tackled, he's a four five eight runner. All right, so he's a monotone runner. Um, he's not gonna make anybody miss. He lacks wiggle. That's the next con. He's he's not gonna he's not sticking his foot in the ground and. Juking the draws off anybody, it's just not who he is. Uh, he's poor in pass pro. I, I, I did not like him as a pass protector at all. And I thought if he's going to find a way onto the field, maybe third downs might be his calling card. Not when you got Jalen Richard, not when you got DeAndre Washington who can do everything. This isn't a guy that's going to crack your roster as a third down back. I don't think he's good enough in pass pro. And then finally, injury concerns. Uh, he, he missed two games in 2016 with some um, injuries that we really didn't know they were undisclosed injuries, didn't play in the final game of his collegiate career versus Stanford in the bowl game. He missed four games in 2016, uh, 2014 with some injuries. The only season he played all of his team's games was 2015 where he had the breakout season. So there are injury concerns with him. Um, there's just a, a number of things going against him, I think, which is why he came out. I don't think he's going to get any better as a running back. I don't think he was going to change anybody's mind. And so because of that, uh, in the seventh round, 242nd pick overall, Elijah Hood for me is a double. He's a solid back. Uh, he's got a shot as a short yardage, you know, in between the tackles runner, which the Raiders currently lack if you take Marshawn Lynch out of the picture. But with uh, Beast Mode in the fold, they don't need a guy like Elijah Hood right now. They have everything they need at the running back position. And so Hood is going to have an uphill battle to make this Raiders roster. And then finally, the final uh, pick in the Raiders draft, seventh round, 244th overall selection. Toledo defensive lineman uh, Trayvon Hester is the selection. A 6'2", 300 pounds. It's the first pro, his size. He's got some quicks. And with those quicks comes a beautifully executed swim move. So I'll lump those two together. His swim move is when he is fresh and he is engaged, it's top notch. All right, it's quick, it wins, gets him in the backfield, gives him an opportunity to make plays. Uh, he's got some awareness to him. I saw him back down the football. Uh, he's a guy that um, does see where the football is, tracks it well. Uh, so he's got some awareness to him. Uh, also, solid at the point of attack. I saw him taking some double teams. I saw him uh, stand up some guys at the point of attack in the run game, be really physical. I watched him in 2015, watched him in 2016 uh, versus uh, uh, Western Michigan, so watched him in a number of different uh, situations. Toledo was really good. In, in each of those seasons, they were in some some big time games, and um, it was guys like Trayvon Hester who helped them get there. Uh, versatility, he could play the nose or the three tech. I think they're going to ask him to play three tech if he in fact makes this Raiders roster. Remember, they lost um, some players in the offseason along the defensive line. 
Stacey McGee being the most notable. So they do need to replenish that position. You draft Eddie Vanderdose. I think that's the guy they're targeting to come in and fill that void. We'll see what happens. But um, uh, Trayvon Hester going to get an opportunity to do so as well. And pass rush potential. This guy had 13 career sacks at Toledo, including a career high five last season. So save this best for last. Uh, I think this is a guy that could potentially get some pressure on the quarterback. Saw him get to the quarterback quite a bit. He was always a step slow, however, but he got to the quarterback a number of times. So uh, this is a guy that I think may have a little bit of pass rush potential in him. Uh, you go to his cons. Uh, his motor and effort are things that I question. Uh, there were times where you could just tell he was gassed. And when he's gassed, he's got nothing for you. Uh, he would loaf on the backside of plays sometimes, play goals away from him. He's not giving maximum effort to get to the football. I, I'm not a big fan of that. But again, when you're 300 pounds and um, it's going away from you and this is the seventh play of a drive, I get it. Um, he's laggy off the line, okay, off the snap. All right, and I told you, he's always a step late getting to the quarterback. Part of that is he's just laggy getting off the snap. And again, uh, just like Eddie Vanderdose, don't get it. You got to watch the football. If you got to go off a of first movement, so be it. But you can't be the last man off the snap. You're not fast enough. You're not quick enough. You're not good enough to do that. Uh, he's another one of these guys that doesn't get off the snap uh, quick enough for me. And then finally, his weight. Uh, he had to cut 20 pounds to get to 300 just to be more of an effective football player in his final year at Toledo because his production dropped off the prior year. And so he cut 20 pounds, got into better shape, and played much better in his final year at Toledo. And uh, it landed him in the seventh round of the NFL draft. Uh, so seventh round, 244th pick, Toledo defensive lineman Trayvon Hester for me is a double to round. I think there's some some value here. A guy that I think can do a little bit of something. We'll see if he is able to develop and grow uh, in Oakland and potentially make this roster as we round out the Raiders 2017 NFL draft. Uh, there are some questionable picks in here. I think these are a lot of, hey, we're just gonna trust in Reggie and his ability to identify talent. He's done a great job since coming on as Raiders uh, GM, but uh, there are some picks that I question. I question the Vanderdose pick. I thought you could have used a linebacker there instead of waiting to the fifth round. Uh, I, I question the David Sharp pick. He looks just like Vidal Alexander to me. I didn't think you needed another one of those guys. We'll see what David Sharp ends up being for you. Um, Marquel Lee is a solid linebacker, but I thought you needed, instead of attacking the safety position and getting two of those, I thought you could have used multiple linebackers instead. So uh, we'll see what the Raiders decide to do. Uh, but in all, you got a home run and a triple to start out the draft. And then every other pick, the other seven, all doubles, which nets you one, two, three, four, five doubles bonuses. You tally all that up. Uh, end up with 31, you divide by nine, it gives you uh, a 3.44 triple for the Oakland Raiders in the 2017 NFL Draft Wrap-Up Series. So uh, that's gonna do it for the Raiders in their draft. I thought it was an okay draft. I thought it, Reggie McKenzie did some things that made me scratch my head, but we'll see if it all works out for the Raiders. Love the Gary Ann Conley pick, love the Ovi Mellon Fonwu pick. We'll see how the rest of their draft shapes out for them. It's gonna do it for your man Louis T here on the 2017 NFL Draft Wrap-Up Series of the Oakland Raiders. I only got one question for you. Who's next? I'll see you next time. Have a go.